Is it Chernobyl? Or is it one of the most important wineries in American history? We are Connor, Ariel, and Elmo, and we are driving across the country to reclaim the story of American wine. It is a story of immigrants, farmers, scientists, dreamers bringing their old culture to their new home. But just as an American wine tradition bloomed, we cut it down with prohibition. This link with our ancestry was cut, and we scattered our knowledge, means, and tastes to the wind. We've come a long way since those dark days. What's in the glass now is better than ever. We are driven to give life to the roots of American wine. We are driven to graft the quality revolution of today with the lost spirit of our pioneers. And we are driven to drink. We set out from New York City on a swampy 90-degree October day, headed up the Hudson Valley, traversed the Catskill Mountains, and headed for New York's greatest wine region, the Finger Lakes. But first we should ask, what the heck is a Finger Lake? Here in western New York, these 11 lakes were formed by advancing finger-like glaciers carving out deep ravines in the earth, then filling them with water as they receded. The three large central lakes, Cuca, Seneca, and Cayuga, support the majority of winemaking. Folks have been enjoying a local glass on these shores for a long time, but many advocates will tell you there's something special happening here. Advocates like Yannick Benjamin, our old friend and the head sommelier of the University Club of New York. Yannick's a cool guy. He's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to aid New York's disability community through the nonprofit he co-founded, Wheeling Forward, and their Wine on Wheels fundraisers. You look at any, for the most part, great wine regions in the world, they tend to be by a body of water, whether it's an ocean, a lake, or a river. You know, one thing that people don't realize is that Seneca Lake, how incredibly deep it goes. I think the last time it froze completely was in 1908. So, of course, you have to be very strategic on how you plant your vines so, so you can, the vines get that heat, that, that, that because just a few feet away from it, you're done. They have this incredible curiosity to want to learn more, to want to do better. Listen, there is no doubt in my mind that the Finger Lakes are a world-class wine region, but I think they're just scratching the surface. I think they're still learning. They're still figuring things out. They are there, but it's only going to get better. We began our hunt for the history of Finger Lakes wine at its pre-prohibition epicenter on the west shore of Cuca Lake Hammondsport. Going to the old Gold Seal Winery building. Yeah, it's supposed to be this like big, grand Italian style chateau. It closed down in like 1984. It has just basically been sitting there derelict. A little thing down there. Maybe. So it's like a three story. Right on top of it. It's disappeared. Ah, there you go. That's it. Okay. This looks like a big abandoned building. Even mighty Google had missed the location by three and a half miles. But this is where the most important wines in Finger Lakes history were made. Founded in 1865, the Urbana Wine Company with their flagship Gold Seal Champagne was just one player in a thriving pre-prohibition New York wine industry. With Cornell's Geneva Experiment Station on Seneca Lake providing expertise in vine material, a network of growers and winemakers flourished. But prohibition cut down all but a handful, headlined by a big three. You've met Urbana, which officially changed its name to Gold Seal on the day Prohibition went into effect. Pleasant Valley, whose great Western champagne was the first American wine to win awards in Europe. And the Taylor Wine Company, 
which famously survived by selling grape concentrate with an explicit warning to not add water and then wait, or it might turn into wine, and that's illegal. These big three had made it through, but the landscape upon repeal was grim. Skilled winemakers had returned to Europe, equipment had been sold, and vineyard land had been converted to conquered grapes for commercial juice. The market had changed too. Tastes for dry wine had faded over the course of prohibition. Determined to avoid this fate, Gold Seal managed to poach the winemaker of Champagne's Veuve Clicquot, Charles Fournier. Under his watch, everything would change. Charles Fournier had signed on for just one year, but he was so enchanted with the Finger Lakes, he would spend the rest of his life here. His expertise from Champagne pushed the company to new heights. The Geneva Experiment Station was producing fine new French-American hybrid grapes every year, pushing the bar ever higher. But the true revolution would come when Charles Fournier had a chance encounter with what he described as an excited little fellow, the man known as Dr. Frank. To learn more about the father of East Coast vinifera, we went straight to the source. So my name is Megan Frank. Um, I'm the fourth generation of our family to manage the winery here. Constantine, uh, my great-grandfather, he grew up, he was born in Odessa, Ukraine in 1899. So they came through my ship, Ellis Island. Constantine, you know, he was 50, so he had already had a long career in Ukraine. He spoke all these languages, but not a word of English, unfortunately. <laughs> he had had vinifera in his forefront for basically since he arrived in the Finger Lakes. But of course, you can imagine this older man not speaking English, not having a lot of clout or credibility. Nobody took him seriously. Constantine was actually able to meet Charles Bonnier at a viticultural conference at the Geneva Experiment Station. And he heard you know, someone with a French accent. He walked over and he was very excited because he spoke French. And he had heard about Charles Fournier. You know, he was very well respected in the industry. And they hit it off immediately. Um, almost on the spot, Charles hired him to be the director of research at Gold Seal. Constantine's story is kind of an amazing American dream. So to really tell it, we need to back it up to Odessa, Ukraine, in 1905. I believe it was the age of six that he decided that he would become <laughs> a winemaker and he had a small garden where he was experimenting with different vines as a child. The family lived in a German enclave there so they spoke German as their first language. As a kind of multicultural family they all spoke nine languages and Constantine's mother every day would speak to them in a different language so that they could keep up. His PhD was in uh, viticulture at the Polytechnic University of Odessa. He wrote his thesis on growing cool climate vinifera varieties. Like, I mean, how perfect is that to set him up what he would later do in the Finger Lakes? Uh, he also managed a 2,000 acre estate in Odessa. Um, and he made a lot of improvements to uh, viticulture, especially in Eastern Europe. He actually developed a plow uh, that would hill up and start to cover the vines. You know, it had to be done by hundreds of people for this massive estate. He developed this piece of machinery. It was very difficult. They survived through the Russian Revolution, World War I, World War II. And World War II was a particularly difficult time because of the German occupation in the Soviet Union. And they, the family spoke German. They had some ties you know, with the community there, but that almost made it more dangerous for them because they weren't really seen as German. So Constantine was um, quoted as saying uh, they were people without a home. You know, they weren't seen as Russian, they weren't seen as German, and they were very lucky to be able to leave. And they were able to first go to Austria and then finally to the United States, to New York. So a really difficult time, basically starting over. The only job he could find was as a, a night dishwasher. He was able to connect with someone who knew about the Geneva Experiment Station at Cornell. You know, he had his degree in hand and hoped that he could convince them. 
he basically somehow talked himself into a grant funded position hoeing blueberries. So that was a step up from washing dishes. So happy about that. And um, that was really his start in understanding what the Finger Lakes was doing at the time. There was the French American hybrids here, the American varieties, but there was no bit of different European species of varieties. And that really perplexed him. Um, you know, why is there no Chardonnay, no Riesling, no Pinot Noir? And what he was told was that it was too cold in the Finger Lakes, which he did not accept at all because in Ukraine it gets so much colder. He really had a difficult time, you know, convincing area winemakers and viticulturalists that, that this was a possibility. I mean, you can imagine when you plant a vineyard, it's such an enormous expense and you're sort of married to it. And Charles was the one to really give him his, his first go. What was Dr. Frank doing that American winemakers had missed for hundreds of years? The key was in the rootstock. Own rooted vinifera was destroyed by the great devastator phylloxera, while the clumsy and unprotected graft unions were destroyed by the cold. Fournier and Frank famously jumped in an Alfa Romeo and toured as far as Quebec and Texas, gathering more suitable rootstock. No word on if they sang along the whole way like us. Constantine's skilled hands made for cleaner grafts set up for success, and his technique of hilling up a foot of soil protected the graft union in winter. The vines survived. Under this roof, Gold Seal accomplished what had eluded America since the days of Jefferson. Gold Seal at the time, you know, they were also working with non vinifera varieties, obviously, but Constantine was very bullish and really wanted, you know, vinifera to be kind of the, the shining jewel. He always said, Americans deserve only excellent. Why would you do, you know, work with varieties that aren't going to give you the best quality wines? Why not only work with vinifera? So that's really where they diverged. And, you know, Charles stayed with Gold Seal and Constantine started his own operation, but they remained lifelong friends. And uh, after that time, 1957, he started our winery, um, purchased the property, and basically began his own experiment station here. So 66 different vinifera varieties, an incredible amount. And the story goes that he picked up a handful of soil and he said, good soil. You know, we have a very high content of shale in the soil, especially in this part of Cuca Lake on the western side. You know, really contributing nicely to the aromatic whites that we do, our sparkling wines. Being an expert in cool climate viticulture, he knew that Riesling would be fantastic here. With the soil and kind of the, the elevation that really attracted him first to the, to the site. He was a researcher by heart, you know, at, at his core, he was a researcher and a scientist. And he, he sold his wines, but he was, that was not his main goal. You know, I've heard so many funny stories of, you know, customers, um, you know, coming back and, you know, saying they were 18 and it was the first winery they ever visited and they knocked on the door and Constantine took them out to the vineyards, he took them into the cellar. He, you know, basically taught them everything that, that he could in a few hours. And then when it came time for that person, you know, to say farewell and they wanted to buy some wine, you know, I heard a serving man say, oh, I, I asked Constantine if I could buy a case of the Cabernet Sauvignon. And apparently Constantine said, oh no, you won't buy that. I'll give you an educational case. So he said, some wines are good, some wines are not so good. And he made him pay for it, and he paid for it. It was just like things that, you know, nobody else could have gotten away with. Um, I mean, he, he also had, he put some obstacles on selling his wine. So for example, our um, Botrytis Trachenbaranosis is style Riesling. So in order for you to buy a bottle, it was $40, which back then in the 60s was a lot of money. And you also had to produce a marriage certificate that you've been married for at least 20 years because you will have understood the sacrifice that it takes to make a wine like this. He was, he was like an open book. He was extremely open, you know, with anyone who would have questions. He used to have uh, a group. 
He called them his collaborators. And they would come from Pennsylvania, and Ohio, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Virginia, you know, all over. Um, and they would come and they would learn from him and he would do these huge, almost speeches outside of the front porch and, and address everybody about why the Vinifera Revolution needs to take place and why equality wine really should be the most important thing. And, you know, he wasn't, you know, looking to be the best or the top one and not share any of these secrets. He was extremely open, um, you know, with his technique. So, I think you'd be really happy to see that, you know, today there's at least one bonded winery in every single state in the U.S., and many of them are planting vinifera. Vinifera still accounts for less than 10% of New York State plantings today. But just that small slice has made believers of wine lovers the world over. For centuries, hopeful American winemakers on the East Coast had watched helplessly as their vinifera vines inexplicably withered in their third season. But thanks to Dr. Frank, a war refugee in the twilight of his career who struggled with English, the key had been delivered to the Northeast, and the revolution was underway. Next time... The wines need to be big and rich and alcoholic and oaky and concentrated and dark and purple and black and jammy and blah, 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 blah. Coca-Cola sued Walter S. Taylor. Again, the romantic story is that there was cherry trees here. So that reason for as well. He lost that particular battle, but he actually ended up winning the war. So, so. Then, so you see, 